And so I think they're going to get off to a slow start. They might wake up at some point. That's why it's important for them to get off to a good start. But I like the spot after the Eagles, before the Chiefs. It's a perfect spot for the Patriots. I do think they have a chance at an upset. The Greg Bedard Patriots podcast is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. He's Greg. I'm Nick. Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles with you this week. Wrapping things up, getting ready for the Dolphins and the Patriots on Sunday. First, I'll tell you, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Greg, just a couple of headlines today. It's it's quieted down a little bit. Funny how that happens after a Patriots win. <laughs> yes. Things things calm down a little. Uh, but first, Jalen Rager this morning was uh, signed to the 53-man roster. Your thoughts on Rager and also your thoughts on the fact that the Patriots now have eight wide receivers on this roster. You mean, wait, we're, we're not firing everybody this week and, you know, already <laughs> before the midpoint of the season. I mean, it's just, you know, and I know and, and I hear from people, I get emails, I get tweets from people like, you know, I'll be on like, for example, after uh, what was their most recent defeat? It wasn't the Saints, uh, the Raiders game. Um you know, and some people are are basically you know pronouncing time of death for the Patriots, and and you know I I I'm just like I just want to see how the season plays out because you know that's how it's judged, and you never know in the game in, in this game what can happen week to week, and that's why I don't try to overreact. I know you know fans have the they're allowed to do that. That's why you know they're fans, they're passionate. Like you know I I get it, but I just I'm not in the same spot. I don't have the luxury of that. I have a team to cover and there's you know now there were 11 games now there's 10 games left in the season and you know we'll see what happens so Jalen Rager uh, of course former first round pick um, that they you know picked up off the scrap heap uh, from I think the Vikings released him I think Uh, but anyways um, what I've seen of him his speed is real on film Um, it's good it seems like on film he uh, reasonably knows where to go as far as his routes and things like that. He had, did have a nice, um, you know, in cut uh, in the last game against the Bills. Um, you know, one of those sort of trust plays where, you know, the Bills are playing off and Mac knows three step drop, boom. You need to, you need to believe that the wide receiver is going to be in the right spot, and he was. Um, you know, it's certainly interesting, Nick, that they have signed him to the roster. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of roster shenanigans going on. Uh, the Patriots, by my count, now have eight wide receivers on the roster. Parker, Bourne, Smith-Schuster, Douglas, Thornton, Boot, Booty, Rager, and Ty Montgomery, you know, however you want to put him. Um, you know, it hasn't really come out that, you know, hasn't really come to fruition that he's the third down back that we thought he was going to be uh, or sort of Swiss Army knife like he was going to be when Matt Patricia was here. Um, he seems mostly on special teams, but, you know, whatever. Um, you know, so obviously that's a lot. Um, that's too many wide receivers. You have to think that there's a roster move coming. Um I thought it might be booty and, you know, maybe he gets a case of the Foxborough flu. He had, he (laughs) came up, he came up last week with an ankle injury, but I checked the injury report. He's not on the injury report um, this week. Uh, You know, look, he keeps getting passed on the depth chart by a variety of people. Um, I think it would be wise, you know, if they can to shut him down for the year. We, we talked all along and I think we're going to have a question about this um, later in our mailbag. Um, So we won't get into it too much now, but um, you know, it it was, it was going to be tough for him to play a lot this year. I think the other possible move, Juju Smith Schuster going on sort of, you know, four game IR um, to heal everything that ails him. He had the concussion. He's obviously dealt with the knee thing, considering where they are right now and coming off their best offensive game and, and look like, you know, the pecking order sort of Kendrick Bourne, and then uh, Demario Douglas, and then filling in beyond that. Um, I think they can afford, and it might be better for the team, just to put Juju, let him get healthy. And, you know, if if there are depth issues later on or they need him, it'd be nice to have a veteran receiver more at 100% later on in the season. So I think that's, you know, um, a legit possibility. But, yeah, I mean, certainly – they have to there has to be an injury concern somebody has to be going on ir for them to make this move 
Well, you know what the saying is, Greg, uh, quantity, not quality. That's what they got at wide <laughs> receiver right now. Um, you know, I- I'm interested to see the wide receiver mix of snaps this week. Last week, we had Kendrick Bourne with the most snaps. Thank God. Finally, somebody that can give you some yak, give you some electricity when they catch the football, somebody that Mac trusts. He was number one in snaps at that position. Douglas was number two. Uh, Devontae took a slide back. Rager took a step up. Does Rager get even more snaps and Devontae gets less? Tyquan Thornton, is he out? I would imagine he's going to be inactive with his big fat three snaps last week. And you mentioned it on the pod earlier this week. One of those snaps, he ran the wrong route. Uh, And Juju, Juju's out there on the practice field for the second straight week. Are, Are they going to play him? As you mentioned, could they actually put him on IR? Could they, you know, stash him away for a few weeks? If he does play on Sunday, is he taking snaps from who? How many snaps right. does he play? That that whole kind of juggling game at wide receiver fascinates me. Yeah, you know, absolutely, Nick. You're, uh, you're totally right to point that out. And it's just, you know, it's interesting. Like, I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of patience with Tyquan. Um, I know there's a lot of fans that that aren't, that don't have that, considering his draft status and and you know speed and upside and things like that they think they want to label him a bust already he he has had a rough go of it as a youngster as far as his health it has not been optimal he has not been on the field enough but you know look i i know internally one of the big sort of complaints about the personnel and their lack of ability to do certain things in the early part of the season was centering around, they had no vertical option in this game and you, yeah. in this team. And you, you need to have that. You need to have that at least threat where, you know, at least one safety is like, all right, I got to stay over the top of this guy. And that, that creates space underneath. If you're, you know, building levels into your, your passing attack, which the Patriots like to do, which, you know, all good offenses like to do. And they've just lacked that. And so, you know, I still have a lot of hope for Taekwon. Um, I think he's bright. His speed is absolutely real on film. It is legit. And, you know, I think between him and Regor, somebody has to present the vertical element in this passing game. I would I would continue on with Taekwon, um, at least until he gets hurt again. But then maybe that's just me. Yeah, I'm not writing him off by any means. Uh, I, people want to write off these young guys immediately. It's silly. Yep. And especially given the injury situation. Now, the injury situation is real as well as his speed. Can he stay healthy as you just mentioned? That's the that's a huge question. I just wonder if they trust him at all. You know, does Mac trust him at all? When, when he's gotten out there, he, he really hasn't proven that he knows what he's doing consistently. So we'll see how all that comes together. Uh, last headline for you quickly here. Malik Cunningham was released. Then they get him back on the practice squad. I don't know about you, Greg, but it is borderline amazing to me that the guy that was QB2 a couple of weeks ago in Vegas, you're a Mac Jones injury away from Malik Cunningham being your quarterback the rest of that game. And then within two weeks, that same guy is getting released. This this QB2 tap dance is insane to me. Is it insane to you? (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's it's absolutely ridiculous but it you know it just it just goes along with all the you know and, and I guess we have no other choice but to you know pin this on Bill Belichick but you know this just goes along with like they he just has zero feel for offense he, he, he offensive personnel he really does he, he has no feel for it I mean you know look back on the like the little Jordan Humphrey stuff you know from last year where the guy's like playing a buttload of snaps early on in the season when they can't generate any offense, including against the Ravens where, you know, they were going to need to score in the 30. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, he's, he's released. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure it will be explained away and has been in, in different circles, uh, you know, around the beat that like, Oh, you know, there were a lot of injury issues and they had to do this and they had to do that. I mean, you know, that's the sort of minutia, the, the margins that Bill Belichick gets lost in. And he, they lose sight of the big picture oftentimes on offense. And, and you know, that Malik Cunningham was one heartbeat away from playing quarterback. I mean, just Nick, just think of it this way. And everybody knows I did my rant on this, um, you know, when it happened. But, you know, just think about this now that like, say, say they, you know, 
say Mac Jones got hurt in that game, the Raiders game, and Malik Cunningham had to go in and they didn't do anything and they had a chance to win that game. And then they go, you know, they beat the Bills the next week. I mean, you know, Bill Belichick willingly left a possible win on the table with what he did at the quarterback position. Now, you know, Malik, you know, if if this this is the second time Malik Cunningham has been released and available to the league and nobody has picked him up. So please stop telling me about Malik Cunningham and, you know, he should play quarterback and he's a weapon. He should do this and that like nobody in the league believes that, um, you know, he's a developmental player. That's what he is. I don't understand the need to, they should have kept him on the practice squad. They should have elevated him again for that game, for whatever package that they were going to do. And then, and then put him back on the practice squad. Um, you know, this dance is just silly, but you know, the bottom line is this Malik Cunningham is a talented kid but he's very much a developmental kid. He belongs on the practice squad. Just leave him be. Let's see where he is next year in camp, and then we can go from there. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. I love those little suckers, those little bonus bets. It's like free money. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, so Greg jumped on X today and uh, asked for your mailbag questions. If you don't follow Greg, which I find hard to believe, but if you don't follow him, it's at Greg A. Bedard. If you don't follow me, much more believable. It's at Nick C Radio. Let's get to some of these questions. Matt Ryan, first on the uh, docket here today, Greg. Not going to make this too complex. So what happened to the booty hype? Uh, Should have never bought into it, you know, as we told you here on – on the podcast, you know, during everything, he got off to a slow, look, he was a late round pick. Um, you know, no question about his, you know, he, he has a pretty good ceiling as a prospect and has a look at what he did his freshman year at LSU. But after that, he's had a lot of injury issues. He's had off field issues. There are a lot of teams that wouldn't even entertain drafting this guy because of some of his off field issues. Now, as we've said before, everything that I've heard from the building, like, They've really liked him in the building. He has been a professional and all that stuff. We don't know. Well, that was a while ago. I don't know if that has continued. Him not having much of a role on this team when he could have, you know, is is he still doing the right things behind the scenes? You know, I don't know. Uh, But I think, you know, the booty hype was typical training camp, rookie, wide receiver. We never have any wide receivers hype. Like, look, I was guilty of it when I was growing up a Dolphins fan, like, you know, especially at the running back position. Like I used to go nuts because they never had a running game and then they'd bring somebody in, whether it was like Sammy Smith, I got a little excited for. Remember, you know, Cecil (laughs) Collins, Cecil Collins, man, I was so excited. I went out to training camp practice or a mini camp practice and like, I was like, he's going to be the answer. He's going to give Dan Marino finally a rushing game. And so, you know, I, I understand, I understand it, but you know, you just got to, especially with these younger guys. I mean, look, they they popped on pop uh, as a six round pick. Don't get greedy. You know, if if, you know, Booty can be a long term developmental guy, maybe he can get his legs back to where he was as a freshman um, being in a professional program and being a professional wide receiver now then, you know, maybe it pays off a year from now. But, you know, to think that two six round wide receivers were going to come in and make an impact in your offense. It's just it just doesn't happen that way. So, you know, Pop is the guy. He is legit. They hit on that. Great pick. Uh, you know, awesome job by the scouting staff. Um, you know, but you know, Booty just, you know, like Malik Cunningham, like just just let it play out. Let him be a young player in his career. Let him develop. And um, you know, they have they have plenty of other options, some I don't love, like Parker and Juju, but this is the bed they made for themselves. Yeah, I still would have given Booty a shot over Parker, especially coming off of that Raiders game. But it feels like since they didn't do that, and I know he popped up last week. I think it was a hammy. I know you said ankle. I th- hammy, ankle, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why he didn't get a chance. But it, it certainly seems like Rager has surpassed him 
they want something out of Thornton, obviously, after investing that second round pick. I would have given him a shot over Parker, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. All right, next question. Eric Larrabee, contractually, can the team get out from under the Juju and Parker contracts, Greg? So I am just looking those up right now at overthecap.com, and you yourself can do that. Um, overthecap.com, great place. Almost all of their stuff is is free on there. So Juju Smith-Schuster uh, has $16 million guaranteed. Um, by the way, his over-the-cap valuation right now is $1.65 million. Um, <laughs> so let's say... <laughs> Let's that say hurts. they wanted. To, let's say they want if they cut him uh, before June first, or trade him, or what? Ha- uh, tra- let's see if trades any trades different. They, they they can they can trade him, and basically the dead money is sort of the same. It offsets. They would save money if they trade him. If they cut him before June first, it would be. Uh, it would be nine point six million in dead cap. Um, basically, they would save like a million dollars. That's uh, that's it. And you know, so it's really Juju's really a two year deal. You can yeah. you can get out anytime you want to. Um, this is also one of my complaints when you know they were one in five and everybody's talking about the future. And I was thinking about doing a column about like, all right, well, you know, what steps would I take as far as the Patriots in the future? And one of the one of the primary things I would do, Nick, is, and I don't know if this is just Belichick refusing to do it or them not having the personnel in house. But one of, if I was general manager of the team, one of the first things I would do is find the smartest cap person um, in the league, and I would start doing some modern day cap gymnastics that the Patriots absolutely refuse to do. Everybody else is doing it. Um, the best teams in the league are doing it. To me, the Patriots are leaving a lot on the field that they did, that they aren't, you know, adding more in future years with all their cap space, with all the TV revenue that's coming in. Um, you know, look, we don't know if it's sustainable. One of the reasons why the Patriots were so good for so long is because they did have cap discipline. To me, that's when the cap was tighter. Um, I think the rules have changed. The rules of engagement have changed on cap management. And I don't think the Patriots have kept up with the times. It's another re- another way that I think they've fallen behind the rest of the league. Um, you know, so Juju, you know, you can get out anytime on Juju after this season. Um, it wouldn't be a huge issue, especially with the amount of cap space that they have. Um, Devontae Parker. Uh, if they cut him, it would be six point three million in dead cap. They wouldn't save a lot if they traded him. Uh, it's a tradable contract. They would probably they would basically save three point four million if they traded him. Um, by the way, his OTC valuation right now is five million dollars. What? How does that happen? Huh? But anyway, huh? yeah, huh? I don't understand that. But yeah, so look, none of those contracts are albatrosses or anything like that they can do anything they want and uh but Devonte is definitely i would say easier to get out of yeah i agree with that all right larry speed stick belichick craft <laughs> mac jones kill one greg marry one and sleep with one who you got well let's see um it's just tough yeah um well i'm definitely um I'm definitely marrying Kraft. I mean, he's got the deeper pockets. He's the billionaire. He got um, the money. I was just thinking yeah. the same exact thing at the same exact time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely marrying him because, you know, and he's getting older. So, you know, the marriage <laughs> wouldn't have to last all that long. And then, you know, I'm inheriting places in Palm Beach and New York City and Brookline and, and you know, all that stuff. You know, all due respect, Robert. I'm not, uh, you know, we're just having a little fun here. Uh, you know. <laughs> kill one a uh, kill one or sleep with one um you know i guess i guess if i had to quote unquote kill one i guess it would be belichick because you know he's not getting any younger i don't think you know he's going to be around for very much longer um and you know and you can always find a a replacement um for him uh sleep with one you know i guess max the last one left i don't exactly know what that means but um I'm trying to have fun and play along. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg would marry the 82-year-old billionaire. 
then he would quickly move on to Mac and, and Greg would be the cougar in that relationship and he would sleep with Mac and then he would then move on to Belichick and he would take Belichick out. He, he would kill Belichick. I, I, I actually should marry, maybe I should marry and kill Robert Kraft, you know, like one of those lifetime movies, you know, like cyanide or something. No, can't okay. do it. Can't do it. Won't do it. You only got one, one option for each person. I actually agree with all of that. Like Belichick's legacy. It's solidified. He's getting older. Like, you know, he's done all that he could do, or he's done most of what he could do with, with football and with his life. So, you know, and Kraft, you talked about a deep pockets and Max got plenty of life to live. So there you have it. Although you, you have to make sure that you cut the relationship off after that one shot with Mac, because, you know, you've got Kraft's money, Greg, and you don't want Mac chasing Kraft's money that you got from Kraft, you know, exactly. eventually. And say Mac would be a li- I think Mac would be a little needy and stuff. <laughs> he would. <laughs> you getting ready for dinner and Mac be yelling at you across the kitchen. Sit, Greg, sit like he was doing what, yeah. pop last week. Sit. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyway, uh, Troy Brown. Is he getting a pass? Uh, this is from Mike 603. Is Troy Brown getting a pass on the inconsistency with the Patriots wide receiver core? Not if you've listened to this podcast for the last two years. I mean, I can't, you know, speak to what other people are, you know, writing and saying. And, um, you know, and I think I've mentioned this before. I don't I don't read and, you know, listen to a ton of other stuff during the season because I like to keep my mind uncluttered and sort of have form my own opinions. I don't want to be, you know, unoriginal and, and unknowingly like you know, crib from somebody else. Um, and when I do hear things, you know, whether it's from like Chris Sims or Greg Cosell or, um, you know, I did mention on Felger and Maz that I did think it was interesting about Rick Spielman was on Tom Kern's podcast and they talked about his philosophy for building um, around Kirk Cousins and uh, when he was GM of the Vikings and, you know, how he sees Mac and, and Kirk kind of similar in that, you know, they're not the – they're not the, you know, they're not the most dynamic athletes at the quarterback position. And, you know, Kirk Cousins likes to step up into passes into the pocket. So it was a premium for him to build up the three interior offensive line positions. It didn't, he admitted it didn't work what he tried to do, but um, you know, but I, I thought that was interesting, but you know, look, as far as Troy Brown, if you'd listen, if you've listened to this podcast and my issues with the route running on this team, uh, I've, I've been very critical of Troy the last two years. And, um, you know, I, I gave him somewhat of a pass Matt Patricia's year because, you know, you need a coordinator an offensive coordinator in the NFL should be able to coach the assistant coaches. And I don't, I don't think Troy was getting that at all last year. And I think it showed and, you know, Bill O'Brien has a lot of fires to put out and, and, you know, I think, you know, you can make the argument that it's getting better. It was better this week. Um, I still had some issues with the routes, including Kendrick Bourne on the second play of the game running the wrong route and Matt getting mad about that. And Pop Douglas ran a wrong route. And, you know, that stuff's going on. Um, but look, I think it's a legitimate question to to ask, you know, is Troy Brown a, a good wide receivers coach? Is he good enough or could they do better? You know, we'll, we'll like everything else, we'll let the season play out and, and you know, have more of an answer after it. All right. Michael Quirion has a question for you. Trade deadline coming up soon. Yes, it is. It's on uh, hot, It's on Halloween. So it's five days away. We're creeping up on it. Uh, could you see the Patriots actually buying, tra- uh, trading for some additional help, Greg, on the O-line? He mentions Jerry Judy. He mentions DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, Broncos, Titans seem to have a fire sale going on right now. Would you uh, – do you see the Patriots adding instead of maybe subtracting before the deadline is up? Uh, I I do not. Nothing major. is it, On the offensive line, I, I don't see it. Um, they put in enough – It and, and look, I'm just putting myself in Bill Belichick's shoes and sort of, you know, the way he thinks and the way I've observed him over the years. I think at this point he's like – I put enough resources into the offensive line and, and, you know, with, you know, they made those two late camp trades right before the season for two tackles. Calvin Anderson is back on the list with an illness. I don't know if this is still the thing that kept him out a while, but man, what a rough go for this guy. 
Um, and he's, you know, even before that, he was a healthy scratch behind a bunch of guys. Tyrone Wheatley Jr. is on IR. Um, Vidarian Lowe is not good right now. I do think he still has potential with the right, if if he has a good offensive line coach, to develop him. Um, the skills are there. The technique is not. It's not even close. But I think they've settled on, uh, you know, and they should get Riley Reef hopefully back at some point. I don't know how serious his injury is. And I do think they liked him at guard. But, um, you know, you do worry a little bit about the tackle depth. Um, you know, Trent Brown uh, got beat up last week. Um, Michael Wenu's dealing still, you know, with the ankle. He's not 100%. Uh, I think they feel okay about um, City So at right guard. You know, he's the weak link, but you can deal with one weak link on the offensive line. They have Moffey behind him, who's, you know, okay in developing. There's also Jake Andrews is out there. You have James Ferentz on the practice squad. I do worry a little bit about offensive tackle depth with what they're doing, you know, with Trent Brown and Michael Wenu. You know, you're one injury away from being back into it, but are they really going to put more into it and get somebody decent? I doubt it. And as far as the other stuff, I mean, maybe I've never been a Jerry Judy guy. I certainly didn't like his attitude with the Steve Smith stuff. That's a bad sign to me where, you know, Smith was being critical of him. And then Judy got all sensitive about it. Like, you know, you know, be a pro. Uh, don't be a big baby. Um, would love to have D hop here. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they're getting him in a trade. He's been really good this year. Um, you know, as far as getting open and stuff like that, that offense stinks. Um, you know, and so I, I don't know. I I don't really see it. I, I would be – I'm more interested in them being sellers. I don't think it helped Josh Uche's cause here that he missed last week and the pass rush was great and did a great job against Josh Allen. Do you really need Josh Uche? If you can get a third or a fourth for him, I would do it. Um, uh, they'll probably hang on to Duggar, which unless they're going to franchise tag him or give him a boatload of money, which I wouldn't do. He was bad last week. I would entertain trading him. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, Nick, what do you, I mean, do you think there's a trade that they could make that's going to make them a lot better? I do think they're competitive and I want to play out the season. And I think they'll be in it somewhat, but I don't know if there's really one trade that sort of puts them over the top. No, not really. I mean, I, there, there are just so many questions, you know, at so many different spots. There's a lot, there's a lot of holes in the boat that you're trying to plug as is. And I just, I don't know if there's that one player, that one marquee name that you could bring in. I, I agree that the Hopkins thing could be interesting. You know, I, I'm not the biggest guy on Judy. I don't think you're going to give up what you would need to give up probably to bring in Cortland Sutton. He's another interesting name in Denver. But there's there's not really a ton out there. Like Derrick Henry is the name everybody's talking about. You're not bringing in Derrick yeah. Henry. So, yeah, as, as far as the offensive line, I hope Trent Brown's out there on Sunday. He's been their best offensive lineman this year. That video – from when he got hurt in the Buffalo game, I think it was Mike Reese who posted that earlier this week. That that video looked bad. Like he went down awkwardly. Somebody hit his leg awkwardly. He did like a split. Did didn't look great. Hopefully he's okay. But if you end up with if this if this offensive line is healthy, relatively speaking, and you end up with Brown, Strange, Andrews, Reef, and Owenu. I think you could do much worse up front than that. So we'll see if they can stay healthy. All right, last question from the mailbag. I know you have another one or two that you wanted to get to, but the last one I've got on the list, this is from Waterboys. If Belichick is back, will Kraft bring in someone to handle personnel? Uh, Waterboys throws a name out there, Jeff Ireland with the Saints. Uh, that's one of the big questions uh, out there, you know, Waterboys. Um as far as after the season, you know, a lot of this stuff, and I get a lot of questions about like, who do you want to see as the next coach? What do you think the Patriots to do? I, I just, I can't get there yet. Like let's, you know, if they're eliminated with like a month or, you know, whenever they're eliminated, we'll start to talk about that stuff. But you know, there's a season to be played and there's, you know, they can win this game on Sunday and then they have a lot of winnable games, um, you know, late, you know, after that and later on in the season and they'll have a bye week to get healthy and things like that. Like, um, you know, I'm all about the season and um, you know, but as far like, I do think the crafts need to take a hard look at their personnel. I mean, we've been over it. Their offensive personnel is just not good enough and their approach to offense isn't good enough. And you know how they are brought into the modern age 
Um, you know, do they give do they give somebody in personnel? Does Mac Rowe work hand in hand with Bill O'Brien? You know, do they bring somebody else in? I have a hard time seeing them bring somebody else in from outside the family on top of Belichick to pick personnel. I mean, I, I just don't think Belichick would stand for that. And, you know, maybe that's one way to move on from him. But I yeah, I, I, I don't I don't see something like that happening. I mean, could they empower somebody more? Yeah, but I still this is all written into Belichick's contract. It would it would get really thorny. Yeah. And, and Ian Rappaport this week with Greg Hill. I think it was Greg Hill. Um, he mentioned that his reporting is that Bill does have final say. He has not heard that anything was taken out of Bill's contract about that. So because the Dale Arnold post from earlier, everybody was reporting stuff on Belichick's contract. Dale <laughs> Arnold had posted that there was some responsibilities laid out and people started to wonder if that meant that Bill no longer had final say or that he gave up some of the power as GM that he once had. Uh, Rappaport said that's not what he has heard and what he has you know, reported. So it seems like Bill still has final say. I, I think as far as the bigger picture and the question of whether or not you keep Bill at these positions, it's like I, I have fallen into this trap as well, saying, oh, if they get to seven wins or eight wins, then Bill will stay as head coach, but the GM title has to go. I also think it, it depends on who you're beating, right? Like if, if they finish with six or seven, if they finish with seven or eight wins, but those wins, like if you look back in Buffalo was by far the best win of the season and they lost to all the good teams they played, then really how much better did they get? They, they just beat right. up and, and, you know, they just beat up fellow mediocre to bad teams. If if they stack up wins against the Giants and the Commanders and the Colts in Germany and, you know, the, Zach Wilson still playing at the end of the year with the Jets and they beat the Jets, you know, here, here at Gillette. I mean, even seven, eight wins. I think you have to kind of evaluate all of it. Who did they beat? How did they look? There's a lot of football left. And, you know, I said last week, my my hope percentage about this season before the Bills game was at 2%. I officially more than doubled my hope percentage. It's now up to 5%. Yeah, big movement. Big movement in the hope percentage this week. And we'll see how they do in Miami, if if that'll affect that number again. So that's where I'm at. All right. You have a question or two, Greg, that you wanted to address from the people. Yeah. So uh, Champ DePug asked, it said, PFF graded JC Jackson high. How do you feel about his play? Uh, if you've listened to this pod, you know how I feel about PFF. Um, I take it with a grain of salt. And, you know, there's a lot of context that needs to be put in to stats. Like, for example, I think I read somewhere that they had City So as the highest rated rookie guard this season with his performance against the Bills. I mean, come on, give me a break. The guy gave up like three to- uh, quarterback pressures, three and a half run stuffs. He was by far the worst on the offensive line. Like, get out of here with that nonsense. Um, you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me if J.C. Jackson graded high in in this game. Um, you know, I do think he – well, I mean, first of all, he gave up the touchdown to um, – to Diggs. Stephon Diggs, you know, yeah. when he didn't tackle him. Like, how can you be rated high when you don't even tackle? It's, you know, uh. you, you don't even touch the guy down. Um, you know, so there's that. But, uh, look, you, there's got to be context, you know, into things. And when, you know, when they're, the Patriots are getting pres- pressure as much as they did, um, you know, on Josh Allen, like, there's there's not a lot of time Um you know, for you to cover. And they did a great job of that. They got, they were able to get pressure before the bills routes developed and, and Ken Dorsey never adjusted. He kept running the same sort of deep level routes where, you know, that was just wasn't a winning strategy against the way the Patriots were playing coverage. Um, But in general about JC Jackson, I think he's, I think he's really good in man coverage. He's still really good in man coverage he's he's had some huge coverage mistakes um he's been playing man when everyone else is cover three and vice versa i didn't see i didn't see that this week um you know but uh he he's he's really good in man the more man that the patriots are able to play and jack with jack jones being back they're able to play a little bit more man um that allows J.C. Jackson to be at his best. If he has to play a lot of zone and have different responsibilities, he can get into trouble. Um, so far, they haven't had to do that. You know, we'll see how it goes, you know, this week against the Dolphins. Oh, and uh, one more question. And this is actually for me. 
uh, just because I think some people, if they were listening to Felger and Maz yesterday, uh, might not have understood the context. But they, you, you, basically, the question is, is it true you flipped off uh, Felger and Maz producer James Stewart after the show on Tuesday? <laughs> um, <laughs> it is true, but there's context. So uh, Jimmy came in hot. Um, we were all sort of hot. I had a feeling going into Tuesday's telecast that it was going to be one of those tractor pull middle of the week things where we're all sort of on each other's nerves. And I didn't like, you know, and I knew it from the day before where they were mocking my column about Mac Jones, which I thought I was accurate. I was giving the kid his flowers for a great virtuoso. Blah. Yeah. virtuoso blah. Exactly. Yeah. And I had to turn it <laughs> off. I heard them doing it. I heard the tone. I had to turn it off because I knew it was going to make me mad. And so I came in and I'd be like, all right, you know, you guys want to, you know, virtuoso to my face and stuff like that. And, you know, Jimmy Stewart, anytime you, anytime you criticize the show, he gets his back up pretty quickly. Yes, Any, anytime yes. you, anytime you criticize their content or their approach to something, he doesn't like it. Hey, I understand it. It's the same stuff with my, my work and, you know, my columns and things like that. And, uh, but just for the record, they could criticize everybody in the job they do. But if you criticize the job they do, a little sensitive yeah um yeah they're like uh you know the sensitive patriots and sensitive bruins fans you know like uh how about padad now uh Potters is better <laughs> you know that that sort of thing um you know but so as i when i leave the show i always make it a point to go by jimmy's window and sort of give him a salute like hey you know thanks for the show and he does it back to me and so yesterday i did it to him uh, tuesday i did it to him but i also um, tossed in a bird. I was smiling. We were laughing and he gave me the double bird back and he was laughing and smiling. You know, we were just busting each other's chops, um, you know, because sometimes we get on each other's nerves and that's fine. That's what happens with these shows. But, um, you know, it was not in a mean spirit. We were just joking around. It was sort of locker room banter. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. And from what I know of Jimmy, he's a good dude. All right. Uh, oh, this episode awesome. Brought to you by a FanDuel, exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. New customers receive 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. All right, Greg, uh, before we get to picking this game, Tyreek Hill could be out. Uh, reportedly a hip issue, did not practice yesterday. And if you heard what Tua Tungavailoa had to say at the podium, what Jalen Waddell had to say, it did not necessarily come across as he's going to play this weekend could this be a legit injury is there maybe some shenanigans what do you think's going on with Tyreek yeah I I don't know Nick I mean you know does anybody else find it funny that like you know he he all of a sudden you know has an injury issue and might miss a game the week before he's supposed to play his former team I mean you know I don't know. And maybe the Dolphins aren't all that worried about the Patriots. Maybe they're just like, all right, well, we'll give him sort of a bye week. You know, we need him against the Chiefs. He's going to want to play against the Chiefs, um, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But that's that was my first thought. Changes the landscape of the game if he's not out there. I mean, yeah, uh, you could argue you could argue that earlier in the season, you know, and really not even early, the, the entire season so far, you could argue that he should be in the conversation of MVP. He's been that good. He he has been that dynamic. So if he's not out there, uh, that would help the Patriots' cause. Of course, if he's not out there and the Patriots end up winning, then how, you know, then we then we have to deal with all the questions next week of, well, would they have beaten them with Tyree Kill and all that stuff? So uh, I don't know if I'd rather have Hill out there on Sunday playing against the Patriots so we don't have to deal with that crap the next week. Or if I want them, you know, out so the Patriots uh, have an even better chance of winning this game. Speaking of their chance of winning this game, Greg, FanDuel line, still Miami, nine and a half point favorites, over under a 45 and a half. How you feeling? So uh, I was surprised. I thought, especially given the Tyreek Hill news, I thought that I thought the number would be more around like seven or seven and a half. And we did. We saw the line drop against the bills last week um as we got up to game time um i haven't watched a ton of dolphins film i probably i watched like three quarters of the eagles game and you know but i did listen to people like you know that i trust like chris sims and greg cosell you know who watch these guys you know week after week and um especially greg cosell talked about like he could 
he he didn't think that the Dolphins did very much motion with Tyreek Hill. Like he couldn't think of one instance. I did not see that on film. And while they certainly had their issues against the Eagles, uh, I didn't think the Dolphins were all that bad in that game. I mean, if Tyreek Hill catches that ball um, late in the third quarter, it's a tie game. It's 17-17. The, the Dolphins, their biggest issue was they had a ton of injury. I mean, uh, penalties in the game. Every time they did something, including, I think, you know, their opening drive, they scored a touchdown to get called back by penalty. You know, they had 10 penalties. The Eagles had zero in the game. Um, you know, while the final score, you know, was rough and, and the end of the game was rough, where I think they were just getting manhandled, I think the Eagles finally wore on them because they're so big on both lines. Um, I didn't think that I didn't think that the Dolphins played all that poorly in that game. Um you know, so I think the, their demise is a somewhat exaggerated and, you know, their performance against the Eagles, that loss, I think, has been somewhat exaggerated. Um, you know, I do think that the Patriots the first time around had a decent plan against the Dolphins. I was definitely critical of it too much. Three deep safety. You know, they gave up a lot of stuff underneath and that ended up killing them in the game. And, yeah, I was more critical of, look, the team's built on defense and special teams. And you know the offense is going to be slow out the gate uh, with a new coordinator and injury issues in the offensive line. And I'm sorry, the defense has to make plays. And you have to be more aggressive. If that means you might give up a big play, them's the breaks. But this is the way you built the team. And so I thought they were way too uh, conservative. Now, contrast that, and I just posted a column last night on BSJ about the defensive approach against the Bills. I thought it was awesome. It was a tremendous job by Steve Belichick and Gerard Mayo. Um, finally, you know, and I've been very critical of them against the Bills, they took the fight to the Bills, and it ended yeah. up winning them the game. I mean, they blitzed like 50% of the time. Half of those blitzes were ma were, were heavy blitzes, six-plus guys. I mean, it was it was unbelievable, and that, that determined the game. Um, now, I do think there's a lot of things that the Eagles do that the, that the Patriots can replicate, including, you know, how – you know, they're big up front. Um, they're pretty, they're somewhat fast on the edges. You got to contain, you got to, you got to condense. I would look for the Patriots to, to, to put a premium on the edge with speed guys. You got to try to keep those motions as much as possible inside. You got to make it an offensive line game because their offensive line is not very good at all. Um, and, you know, you got to play from in front. If you play from behind against that Dolphins team, it's over. And so it's important for the Patriots to get off to a really good start, just like they did against the Bills. And but I do think they have a I think they have a puncher's chance in this game. I am definitely picking them to cover the point spread. Um, you know, I think it will be more anywhere from three to seven points. Uh, but, you know, I do and I do like this spot for the Patriots. I do think, yes, you know, the Dolphins might be a little bit grumpy coming off the Eagles game, but I think more importantly, that's a very big physical team that takes a lot out of you when you're a finesse yeah. team like the Dolphins are. And so I think they're going to get off to a slow start. They might wake up at some point. That's why it's important for them to get off to a good start. But I like the spot after the Eagles, before the Chiefs. It's a perfect spot for the Patriots. I do think they have a chance at an upset, uh, but I'll probably end up picking the Dolphins by about three or four points in this game. I like the point about the Eagles coming off the Eagles game. They they are a physical tough team to play. So Miami's got a ton of injuries. The offensive line is all banged up. Isaiah Wynn on the IR. Armstead is out. Uh, Connor Williams has been banged up, although he's been on the practice field. That's their starting center. If you're wondering, uh, Eichenberg has been replacing him to, uh, lately, but it does look like he has a chance to play. Williams has a chance to play, but that old line is banged up, and they're not very good to begin with. Defensive backs, Jalen Ramsey's out there practicing. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, Fangio said that he's not sure if he's going to play on Sunday. They're just trying to get him more involved. We'll see if Ramsey's out there. He was supposed to get out there by December, so this would be a very early return. But Ramsey's been out there this week. Uh, Holland, who's a tremendous safety, he, he's in concussion protocol. He might be out. Um, Xavier Howard did not play last week due to a groin injury, so their defensive backs are all sorts of banged up. Tyreek Hill, we mentioned him. Raheem Mostert. Wasn't out there on the practice field yesterday. He's a little dinged up. Uh, a Chan, A Chain, A Chun, A Chun. Uh, he is he's on the IR with an injury. So this team is just ravaged right now with injuries. 
Red zone is going to be a big deal. Uh, they're a really good red zone offense. And if we remember back to the game earlier this year, the defense for the Patriots, the plan didn't have an issue with it. Them laying back and not giving up big plays. They did a great job on Tyreek Hill, even though Jonathan Jones uh, was not playing in that game. The issue was in the first half, they gave up touchdowns and not field goals. Their red zone defense broke. It, they they have to be better defensively inside the 20 when the Dolphins get into that red area. And I'm interested, Greg. I'm just fascinated to see the approach from the Patriots. Will they build off of what we saw against the Bills? Will we see that consistent motion from O'Brien? Will Bourne and Douglas get most of the snaps at wide receiver? Will we see some of those things, more play action uh, from Mac and getting him into a rhythm? Will we see more of that continue? Or is that going to be a one-week thing? Will Juju come back? and clunk it up, so to speak. So uh, I'm interested to see the approach offensively and defensively, as you mentioned. Their their approach was, was worked. I think Bill would tell you that their approach worked for the most part earlier this year against this team. Do they go back to that, or do they mix it up like they mixed it up against Buffalo? Very interesting game to watch. Yeah, I will say the biggest week. The biggest the one thing I wanted to mention, the biggest key for the defense, and the Patriots did a reasonable job of this um, in the game, but – the most important thing against Tua is to take away his primary read. When you do that, then he starts yep. to panic um, and, you know, starts throwing off his back foot and, and pitter pattering and stuff like that. So that's the most important thing in this game. I think the, they'll obviously change from what they did the first time. Belichick never likes to play somebody the same way twice, uh, but that's the premium when you play against Tua, take away his first read. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the nine and a half is a little heavy. So I, I'm yeah. going I'm leaning with the Patriots to cover this. And I'd go the over. I'd go the over 45 and a half. I think both teams could score some points on Sunday. All right, uh, BSJ, check them out. 50 bucks for the year. Bedard, Giardi, obviously doing great work with the Patriots. Uh, Corrales rolling with the Celtics with that win last night against the Knicks at Madison Square Garden. Uh, Hags has joined the crew as well to cover the Bruins. So ja- Joe Haggerty is there as well. So check them out. One last thing to squeeze in here, Greg. Uh, you love the name Deflator. We're going back to the BSJ <laughs> member question, which we haven't done in a long time. But uh, Deflator asks Tyquan Thornton, lack of snaps. Are they easing him back in? Does his tape look bad? Or is it more of a case of him missing time and being behind the eight ball? So he needs time to get reacclimated before they trust him. Yeah, I think it's just it's it's the lack of practice time. When you're a young player, especially a receiver in a complicated offense, you need to be on the practice field. You need to play games. You need that tape. You need the teaching points from it. You need to earn the quarterback's trust. And Taekwon's just missed way too much time. And I think, you know, the best you can hope for for him this year is to slowly, you know, stack success. It would be nice at some point here if he hit a shot play. I assume, the, you know, I would assume they're going to dial one up for him if he's active and all that stuff um, in one of these games coming up here. And, you know, you just sort of, you know, build from there. But I think I think against the Bills, the way the Bills play with the zone and the two safeties that they have who are really smart, um, I think it was more of a short intermediate game, which it was because Mac Jones had the second lowest average depth of target at like 4.3 yards last week. Um, there will be other games against, especially once they play more man-to-man teams. And the, the Dolphins don't really do that. But against man-to-man teams, they're going to need more – speed on the field and somebody who can just take somebody and go and beat somebody and they don't have enough of those guys um you know so he's not much of a zone guy look for him more against man teams but you you just want to slowly build him up he just he's missed too much time he needs to practice he needs to play he's greg i'm nick back next week recap this game peace the clns media network is powered by fanduel sign up at fanduel.com slash boston and get in on the action with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. 